Hi, this is Eric Huberman, and you're listening to Making the Marketer. I'm here today with Xavier Kochar, two-time media entrepreneur, both with successful exits. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me. So, you know, pretty good track record there, but would love to hear, you know, give me a little more background. What have you been doing the past while? Sure. Uh, well, um, since, since the last company, which was a structured data company where we used our technology to create a personalization engine in video, that company was called the Video Genome Project. Since that company got acquired, uh, I have been in this space helping uh, young marketers, young uh, uh, media entrepreneurs, startup companies, as well as the larger MVPDs uh, and direct-to-consumer over-the-top players as well. Awesome. awesome. And so, perfect segue, how did you get into marketing? Like, what Marketing and media, Like, what kind of drove you that direction? I feel like at you know, three, four years old, it wasn't like, I'm going to be a fireman, I'm going to be an astronaut, I'm going to be a media mogul. Yeah, they, right. That's, that's absolutely right. I, 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 I did not. I, when I was uh, three or four years old, I think I wanted to play shortstop for the New York Yankees. And, uh, uh, but I will say that I always had an affinity towards uh, media, um, primarily um, because when I, was, uh, when I was a small child, my father uh, owned a video store. Um, I, don't, I, I don't even know if maybe people remember those video stores, but these... Back in the day, even before Blockbuster, before there were Blockbusters, there were these sort of the mom and pop VHS beta stores. And my father, uh, whose responsibility was to take care of you know a young version of me while my mother uh, worked in the hospital, uh, he would pick me up from school and he would uh, take me to the store. And what I did, I literally watched every single video that was in the store, starting obviously with the children's section. Yeah. And most of those videos were you know, when you're six, seven years old, were cartoons, so Disney and Warner Brothers cartoons. So I kind of had an affinity towards movies and television from a very, very young age. Uh, and that kind of stuck with me. And uh, when I went, I went to school, mm -hmm. uh, went to school back east, and then I uh, went to business school up in the Bay, I kind of got off that track a little bit, and I got caught up with, uh, you know, things like finance, um, because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. And sure. so right after school, I was an investment banker for a bit. Um, wasn't really my thing. Uh, had an opportunity to, uh, early in my career, very early in my career, uh, to go uh, help be a part of a new group that was forming at the William Morris Agency, uh, back when it was the William Morris Agency and not WME. Mm -hmm. And that group uh, was called Corporate Packaging. Uh, and digital and and what I did as an agent there was I brought brands into Hollywood and into uh, media and content properties. Sounds interesting. I mean, you have the interest background of brands and of you know media, as you said, but then the numbers side of it as well with investment banking and that confluence has become more become more and more prevalent in marketing. Like it used to be more pretty pictures, you know, pretty design, and now it's much more data driven, media driven, or numbers driven. Excuse me. And so it seems like you know. As they say, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, you can put a, connect the dots backwards, but you know, and you kind of end up in this position where it brings all of your experience together. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, I would love to be able to look you in the eye and tell you I had this twenty year strategic plan where I was going to pick up a little bit of finance and uh, numbers and pick up a little <laughs> more of stats and pick up some creative and some talent. But really, more than anything else, I think uh, the reason. Um, the reason I am where I am today is that I've I've been very open and flexible to what has what what has come to me in my life. And yeah. sometimes even when it the even when the the turns feel wrong, if they feel like I'm making a hard left turn um, from going from banking to being to working at a talent agency, uh, that back now I feel like it's much more accepted. But 20 years ago, that wasn't that wasn't a usual thing. Yeah, your parents um, freaking out a little bit. Like, what do you? What kind of decision are you making here? <laughs> oh, completely, completely. In fact, uh, <laughs> in fact, um, so much did my mother not understand what I was doing. I remember at uh, at uh, at reun uh, you know Christmases, Thanksgivings, uh, anytime the family's uh, family the uh, extended family would get together, my mother would very would beam. She said, my son, the talent agent, my son, the talent agent. And all my relatives would go, oh, you're a talent agent. Uh, you work in Hollywood. Who do you represent? Is it Tom Cruise or Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> or Julia Roberts? 
and I very sheepishly kind of had to sink in my chair and I said, um, Texas Instruments, uh, <laughs> like Nokia. Uh, I, I worked with brands, yep. you know, so, um, and I tell you, the, the, the look of disappointment I got, you're like, you mean you can't go to a movie premiere? And I go, uh, but there's a new P&G product, you know? So. <laughs> well, and what's funny is now I feel like it's switched a little bit and people, if you drop the big brand names, like I work with Red Bull and I work with these guys and they, like people gravitate towards that now. It's become sexier to be in the business world. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I, you should have seen the speed at which I would get thrown out of meetings at studios and networks and content companies when I was pitching uh, brands. And, you know, when it was very much a producer's game, very much a talent game. And I said, hey, look, is, is there a way that we can get uh, British Telecom uh, in this piece of content? Or maybe if we did some sort of alliance or a partnership. And everybody would kind of look at that. How, the amount of times I, I got the, who is this kid? Why is he here? You know? <laughs> um, and it's funny because exactly what you said, I just kind of stuck with it. And... I feel the industry sort of came came a, a, around and what ended up happening was because I had been building these relationships and developing this goodwill with Madison Avenue, mm -hmm. with the, the advertisers and with a, a lot of companies, digital companies, which ended up being the precursors to the, the big digital platforms. I ended up having a lot of these, um, the so really the, the relationships and expertise to that became valuable in the last 10 years or so. Makes a lot of sense. And so through all that experience, what do you think makes a good, you know, media or marketing person? Like what, what are those characteristics or those traits that, you know, people should look to develop to you that you think actually makes someone good? So um, I would say, I, I'd say w one characteristic, which is really sort of a, a, a crossover for almost irrespective of what in industry or what trade um, you're interested in is uh, a curiosity. Uh, I mean, I am constantly, uh, and I have been for a very long time, fascinated and super curious as to how things work and, and how people got where they got. I actually think uh, even this podcast, Eric, that you and Hawk Media put on, this is, this is a great thing because part of it is, if I'm not mistaken, you are bringing in senior executives and interesting people and saying, hey, and being curious about their journey and their path. And I think uh, that curiosity, and particularly for me, it is even to this day an insatiable curiosity. I'm not, I don't even think that I, even the areas where I'm considered a subject matter, I'm, I still am curious about what's, what's, uh, what else is out there, what's more. So I, I would say there's that. I would say it really, um, the next um, characteristic is an understanding of the game or the industry. So um, the notion of disruption. Uh, so disruption can come from inside or outside, but I think the, the cases of pure outside disruption, mm -hmm. we, we tend to over-glamorize and they get a disproportionate amount of attention. An example, of course, being what Mark, uh, what, uh, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook did. That was clearly outside disruption, yeah. right? Um, a dorm room, a couple of dorm room kids tinkering around for a separate reason. I actually think that that's very rare. And yep. certainly when that happens um, and it goes big, it's that's the reason we kind of put so much media attention on it because it is so rare and it, and it can become big. But I actually think that the second characteristic to answer your question beyond an insatiable curiosity is an appreciation and an understanding for the history of, of the business. So how, why is the business where it is today? Because only if you know the rules and you know the history and you know the players, only then can you be in a spot to change them and do something about it. And I think you made three perfect points there. Number one, you know, eternal curiosity. We actually had a talk here the other day at Hawk Media. Uh, the game that all kids love to play, why? Why is the sky blue? Why? 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 You, you get told at a young age to stop doing that because it annoys your parents. But here we actually want people to ask why constantly. Like, you know, in a bad case scenario, you know, Facebook ads aren't performing. Why? Well, you look into the numbers, da, 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 da. Oh, well, the conversion rate on the site's bad. Why? Well, you know, compared to other sites, it looks like the site's boots. So why? Oh, well, they're over, you know, these pages are robust and like, you know, are taking a long time to load. Why? 
Well, because they're not being managed right. Well, great. There's a solution. There's, yeah. yeah. And, and so, you pinpointed the you pinpointed yeah. where the where the problem was. As exactly. Well. From the instead of this overarching, our ads aren't working. It's like no, no, no. It's this page is too bloated. And you know, like, let's fix it. It's it's such a, it's such a great point, and it's something that once you get caught up in any sort of going concern or a business, um, and even as a marketer, you you kind of you kind of just focus on whatever the 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 intermediate the short term or intermediate goal is, and I think every now and then I, I kind of call it like you know forest for the trees. Yep. Every now and then, you know, get into a helicopter, go straight up um, from the forest, and just take a different vantage of, of it. Yep. And it's so I, I love that story that you just told um, of what you guys do here at Hawk, because when when I founded the Video Genome Project. You know, I did not intend to found, find it, found the company or start the company. I would love to tell you that there was some white space and I did some business analytics and realized that there was some upside. The, the company actually came to be because I was at home and I was looking for a video, looking for a movie. Uh, one, one of a, like a, a really fun movie that um, I love to watch called Forgetting Sarah Marshall, and I knew I <laughs> yeah. had I knew I had access to the movie across all my services, but I couldn't find it. Yeah. And um, when I l later asked all my friends in the industry, the platform uh, the platform guys, the metadata guys, the you, you know everybody, the content guys, I said, look, why the search guys? I said, why couldn't I find this movie? And they all said they all said. Uh, well, you see, the way search and discovery and recommendation systems work is they rely on the metadata. And for a, a lot of times, most times, we don't have deep and rich metadata on film and TV. And that's why the search tools and that's why the curation tools suck. And I, yeah. exactly what you just I said, why? Yeah. Why don't we have the, and, and as I started asking those questions, I realized that we actually do have them the issue is not that we don't have them. The issue, they do exist, and they exist across the co uh, collective and digital ecosystems, but they just aren't, they don't exist in a centralized, aggregated, structured fashion. That was the problem, not that we didn't have it. Yep. So what, and then when, then I said, well, why don't we have a company that does this? And everyone just sort of said, I don't know. I said, all right, I'm going to create that company. And marketing and entrepreneurship in a nutshell. Exactly. And the last step of that, why not me? <laughs> Why not me? Why not me? And and it is it is taking that you know kind of that measured risk. You know I I yeah. think that it's very very sexy to say, screw it. I'm going to give everything up and I'm going to do it. But I think in in life I think that we have parameters such as families and financial considerations. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think those other two things that I mentioned earlier, curiosity and an appreciation uh, for the history. I think those those two um, attributes are going to make your jump a measured jump well and you know they talk about you know taking the risk taking the leap all that and in, in these kind of things and you know i have a friend starting his own business right now that has a great job and my advice to him was keep your job so you can't you know like keep working at it but like why, why? like it's measured risk because it, the problem is if you run on blind risk you're going to you're going to like it's a, then it's just a game of odds at some point you're going to screw up and if you're betting that you know farm every time you're going to lose the farm and so you, it, you know, peop, it's calculated risks, as you said. Calculated risks. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you know, through all of this, you've obviously learned a lot. What would you tell someone just trying to get into marketing media? What should they look at? What would help you have maybe saved a few years or things you did that you're really happy you did? So what would be that piece of advice you'd give? So I think we spent uh, for for a younger person, and again, this I think this uh, advice is appropriate for uh, many industries, but in particular marketing. I think we spend a big part of our earlier careers uh, trying to figure out what it is that we want to do, and um, and that's not a bad thing. But but often, as was the case with me, so I didn't. I don't think I did this in the optimal way. I didn't know that I spent the first five to ten years of my career that I was figuring out what it was that I wanted to do. I actually, if you if you caught. A, uh, a young version of Xavier as an investment banker, he would have told you that year one, I'm going to, I'm going to do big deals. I'm going to, I'm going to do the AOL Time Warner deal. I'm going to do that one. Maybe not. That's a, that's a, that's a horrible deal. But, um, uh, and, and what I would say is that if it's, it's extremely hard, uh, even, you know, really Eric, even at our age, it's hard 
to uh, have a, a longer term view, but if you kind of look at your life you know, in longer increments and you say, okay, what is, where do I want to be in 10 years? And okay, so what does that mean? Where does, what does that mean uh, for where I need to be in eight years, five years, three years? And sometimes, just like in school, sometimes you take an elective, even though it's not part of your major, because it rounds you out. Yep. And so, and, and what I have found is similar, uh, similar to you know, what you were, uh, how you uh, opened up the, the podcast where you, you mentioned that it, uh, you were referencing uh, Steve Jobs, the Stanford's commencement speech, where he said, it's not when you're going through it that do the, oftentimes the events make sense. It's only in, in retrospect and when you look back, can you connect the dots? And some of the most innovative, I, I actually think this, this is very, very, this is key if you want to really materially affect an industry or, or society, is, is if you pick up lessons from other kind of walks of society or other, other industries. Uh, you know, what Steve Jobs mentioned in that commencement speech was it was because he audited a class in calligraphy that that he brought those sort of design sensibilities to the personal computer. Uh, and it was because Elon Musk learned from um, his PayPal, his X.com and PayPal experience, and he's, he's brought learnings over from other industries. And quite frankly, that's, it's the same, I mean, I'm putting myself in, in the oh, same okay. camp as the two of them, but, um, but it's because I was a finance guy, and then I was at a talent agency, yeah. and then later in my career I worked at the Walt Disney Company, uh, and then I and then I understood uh, data, uh, and those t and when you're going through it, it doesn't seem like those any of those things are congruous, and it's only later. So the advice I would give is, it's okay. You don't have to. You know, there are four quarters to the game. You don't have to. You don't have to win the game in the first five minutes. Yep. So that that I, if someone had told a younger version of me, oh, by the way, I probably still wouldn't listen because I was <laughs> uh, I was brash and impatient. But uh, uh, that would have saved me some time. Yeah, I was fortunate enough to look at my summers in college as well as the year, few years after as a time to learn. And like, really, what I kind of and I'm not that far out, but being 31, I'm, I really like to think is your teens and your 20s are the time to learn. And so. I took jobs along the way, like, am I going to learn from this at a point that will advance my career a little more? I didn't know, and I honestly had no idea where I was going, but, you know, I took a sales job, door-to-door -door sales job my sophomore year of college because I was like, I need to learn sales. No matter what I'm going to do, this can be valuable. And I think the same point of the advice, like, that's something I'm very happy I did because similar, you know, I'm, again, doing the same thing, putting myself in the category, but similar to Steve Jobs and calligraphy, like, there's probably something in there that taught him like I, this would be valuable in some way like I, whether it's for personal or professional I want to learn this and I, I, I think not losing that in the future either because 30, 40, 50, 60, whenever like we live a long time now you can start your career whenever mm -hmm. and so it doesn't take long to build a career and so I think continuing that mindset while also moving forward and then at some point you do kind of put yourself into hopefully a path that you enjoy that makes sense if you're looking back and go, you know, it all adds up. But I think when you're just getting started, not stressing about like, is this the decision for the next 50 years and just worrying about now? Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I, and I also think that earlier in your career, there is not an expectation for you to, to go deep or kill it in any one vertical. Uh, later in your career, uh, the irony is, is that later in your career, what why you get why you get paid a lot of money or why uh, how people are going to extract a lot of value from you is less so on your breath but that eventually you are going to have to narrow and focus one thing so for instance you know I know you Eric and you have a, a, a breadth of skills and talents but for now the the area that you're known as is marketing mm -hmm. is media you know, you, that that is the, that is the area. That's your expertise, and that's kind of your calling card. Yep. So the the idea is the quicker you can get to that, the quicker you can start adding value to the world, as opposed to kind of learning and, and yep. extracting value from. The world. Yeah, going deep at some point really matters. And I mean, my track record, not to dwell down on it, but like. I thought marketers were a joke in college. I make fun of them. So like, where do we go back that far? Then uh, I thought I was going to be in real estate the rest of my life the day I graduated, but I started a week before the entire banking industry and real estate industry collapsed. Like, 
there's again looking forward. Who would have, I would have never thought I'd be sitting here, but you, you know, uh, to that to that point about the real um, about being you being in real estate. The other thing that I I, I would say, uh, so I, I coach soccer and I've coached for the last eighteen years, and uh, and there's this phenomenon that I've noticed. Uh, uh, it's boys soccer, and, and more recently, in the last several years, it's been uh, boys under nineteen. So these are kind of they're very very skilled, uh, mm -hmm. 17, 18, 19 year olds. And there's this phenomenon that I, I guess I must have done it too when I when I was growing up playing sports, but um, that I noticed that it, particularly when you've been sitting on the bench for a little bit or sitting on the sidelines or you're eager to get in the game, you uh, when your number gets called, sometimes what happens is these players uh, tend to overplay. And what I mean by overplay is that they're so aggressive. They go to they always go to. Um, where the ball is, or they're, they're, they're playing almost too hard. And now that's a strange thing to say because in our society, that, that this is a separate point from having a strong work ethic, but where you just kind of, you, you, don't, you don't take in the game. Yep. And one of the things that, that whether you're a soccer player coming um, off the bench into the game um, or you're a person that's you know in their life and their career, is what I like to say is let the game come to you a little bit and take take the cues from a, a game, life, etc. So I will, t just to get very specific and personal, you know, I have been uh, an operating executive for the last 20 years in some capacity or another. In the last, in the last couple of years, I have been uh, an investor and an, an advisor. And this, as the operating side of me, is, it's, it's been very difficult, right? But part of what's been going on in the last couple of years is our, particularly the space that, that I have uh, kind of gone deep in, which is media, um, video, advertising, there has been great tumult in that space. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stuff uh, going on and the dust has not yet settled. And so I can imagine a younger version of me that says, I don't care coach, just put me in the game. But a more measured version is saying, you know what, look what's going on in the industry and let's react accordingly. Yep. No, and I think that's great advice. So I'm going to leave us with one last tip from you. You've had a lot of insight. You've done some very cool things in the media space. Where do you think we're going to be one year from now? What are some things we should be aware of? And then where do you predict things are going in the next five or 10? So as far as, uh, as, far as marketing and, uh, and media, so, uh, and I know that the, I know there are distinct uh, areas, but I, for me, I see a great, uh, a great uh, deal of overlap. This notion of direct to consumer is, I believe that it is going to permeate through almost every aspect of business and industry. We have not been able to do that historically over the last uh, 20, 30 years, primarily because of the technology. Now the technology exists. So I believe that a, a trend for the next five years uh, and out is that uh, marketers will be able to go direct to consumer, but but in the way that they, but but just because they will, I'm sorry, just because they can does not mean that they should. And I think marketers need to um, understand that if they want to be in the direct to consumer business, they have to make a commitment that their 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 interests are the consumer. And I know most marketers kind of kind of have this idea that. That yes, of course, the customer. We're all about the customer, but being and I'll give you a great example, um, and you probably know him as well as uh, Michael Dubin from um, mm -hmm. a Dollar Shave Club. So that is a marketing company. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. It, yes, they sell razors, but you know, it's. I wouldn't say that they didn't innovate the razor. That's right. Yeah, they innovate the razor. <laughs> razor. But the difference was uh, they went direct to consumer because because the technology existed and they could, and. And, because, and they focused on uh, the consumer and the relationship direct to consumer. Now, uh, a, a P&G or a Unilever, uh, and ultimately Unilever acquired them, um, you know, they had to go through uh, other channels. Mm -hmm. And I think if you are a marketer, of course, you cannot abandon the, your other distribution channels, yep. uh, but you need to have an eye towards this direct to consumer. And primarily why that's important and why I think that uh, even if it's if it's going to cause a little bit of, of uh, uh, pain in your company to transition or to have a, uh, a practice that goes direct to consumer, 
it's very important so you can gather first party data. Exactly. I, I think you did hit the nail on the head. I mean, purchases, still 90% of purchases are done in store and in brick and mortar. So going to direct to consumer online, like you're, if you just do that, you're eliminating 90% of your potential customers. Like, don't do that. But the amount of benefit you get from the first party data and from knowing exactly who they are and what they're responding to and which products are selling, et cetera, like having that as an organization is something new. And I think that is incredibly that, valuable. That, that's right. It's, it's when we were, uh, so we had a very strong uh, data science practice at the Video Genome Project. And it, it, at the, the four or five years that uh, we were building that, that uh, we had the company, I, I sort of changed my view of how I understood the truth. So, um, and, and, what, and I came to appreciate the importance of first party data as it relates to the truth. Here's, here's what I mean. If, if, I, took a, uh, if I took a coin, uh, a quarter or something, and, and you had never ever seen a quarter before, one size heads, one size is tails, and I said, um, uh, hey Eric, uh, what do you think the odds are that um, what, what's gonna come up heads? And you say, I don't know. And I said, I'll tell you what, let me flip it. I'll give you some information. Let, let me flip, it, flip the coin 10 times. And I flip it 10 times. And it comes up heads 80% of the time, 8 out of 10 times. And you might say, you know what? Okay, I know. It's 80% of the time, it's going to come up heads. That's the way quarters work. Yep. Well, that data, even though I gave you data, yep. there's not enough data. And there's not enough data at scale. Yep. But if I flip that coin 10,000 times, Yep. Guess what? It's going to start looking closer to the truth, closer to 50-50. And with data at scale, you start actually seeing what is going on with consumers and the yep. market. That is why it used to be Walmart. It still is Walmart. But that's why Amazon and, and Netflix and video, for instance, are so powerful because they have, been, they have the data of flipping coins a million times. Yep. And so they're, they're actually getting closer to the truth. And the thing is about this that we, I, I say that the more data that you have uh, and structured data that you have, you know, the, the closer you get to the truth. You become asymptotic to the truth. You'll never actually get to the truth, but you'll come very close to the truth. And I think that is the most important thing for marketers. Yeah, no, I mean, at Hawk, we actually have kind of done the same thing. We've worked with, you know, over a thousand companies. We've looked at data of thousands of companies marketing. And so now, instead of trying to make decisions in a vacuum, and similar to the phrase you used earlier, we look at the forest from the trees. We take a step back. We look at what their industry looks like. We look at just the internet looks like and what to expect. And so we can have arguments about, you know, when someone's looking at their own conversion rate, they go, this is terrible. Like, I'm only get closing 2% of customers. We go, at your price point, that's double what every other NASA is doing. It's those kind of conversations we're able to have because of that statistical significance of the data. Which is why I think... Even, I say even, but uh, companies like yours are important, particularly for, for, uh, for marketers that don't necessarily have, that maybe they only have access to 10 coin flips because with your expertise and you have how many clients now? I mean, you've been in this business long enough where you have access to 10,000 flips. Yeah. So, and if someone can leverage that, that information that, and that expertise that comes from that, they also will get closer to the truth. Yeah, and we've seen it. Apparently, we're valuable. It's been nice. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, well, Xavier, thank you so much for being on Making the Marketer, and we'll have to do it again soon. I'd love to. Thank you for having me. Absolutely.